Hello to our friends joining us via recording. Today we are working on lab lesson number seven. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, the different kinds of muscle tissue a little bit more in depth. We're also gonna talk about the words that we use to describe how muscles contract, so the kind of movements they do. And we're gonna work on our first set of bone markings and muscles uh, for, for the semester. So I mentioned this to my friends here in class today but wanna make sure that the recording knows as well that when you look at the homework for the weeks that are, are going forward now, everything after the midterm, remember that you're going to have assignments that just cover the new information for the week, like our muscle tissue stuff, and then you're gonna have separate assignments that are covering the bone markings and muscles. So make sure to give yourself plenty of time to complete the assignments that we have going on right now there are going to be a lot of different assignments, both in visible body as well as in Blackboard to make sure that we're, we're covering all the content. Yeah, so uh, Kaylin's mentioning, and it's true, we are, are pretty much halfway through the class. That's really exciting, right? So halfway through the class, and, and as we're pointing out in the chat, several of us only have the top half of our body. <laughs> so uh, several of my bitmojis are, are missing their legs. I've only got a couple with legs. So feel free to send me a new bitmoji if uh, you would like to have legs. I, I tried to hide all of my friends that don't have legs in, in the back, but there's only so much I can do to hide those missing legs, right? <laughs> we can just pretend that you're, you're sitting all cross-legged or something, right? That's why we can't see the bottom half. <laughs> all right, so let's start by looking at the activity that we did with our classmates before we started class today. First thing that we did when we came into class today is we looked at some images of our different types of muscle tissue and then we use those images to help us match up some of the locations or as we'll see in a moment, some of the features that we see in the tissues or uh, the way that they contract. We're matching them up with the pictures. So I know some of my groups typed. I had at least one group though that drew some lines. I'm gonna do some, some line drawing here to, to connect our, our, our lines here. Before I, I start matching stuff up though, we need to go through and we need to name our types of muscle tissue that we see here. So let's start with this one here at the top. This one here at the top, what kind of muscle tissue do we see up here? Let's label our muscle tissue up here. Yeah, so this muscle tissue up here, remember that we can tell that this is smooth muscle and not dense regular connective tissue because see how wide those nuclei are, those dark spots that we see in this tissue? Those are the nuclei of the cells. Nuclei are wider. When we look at dense regular connective tissue, you see really squished dark spots because that's where the cells are. They're actually on the outside of all the fibers. So a quick reminder for us that this is smooth muscle with those, those large purple nuclei that we see here. What's the next kind of muscle tissue that I see here? What's my middle kind of muscle tissue? Yeah, this is skeletal muscle tissue, skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle tissue, remember the way that we said to remember it was you can see the stripes on here. So light and dark, light and dark alternating. And we also see cells that are really long and skinny. So really long, skinny cells that have those stripes on them, that's skeletal muscle tissue. Which means by process of elimination and by recognition of our picture, which kind of muscle tissue is, is my last one down here? What kind do we see in the bottom? Yeah, exactly. This last one down here is cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle tissue. So cardiac muscle tissue, we can see those cells that are kind of branching, that are, are kind of going in different directions. And we can see those dark lines that we'll talk about here in a moment. All of those things that we see in cardiac muscle tissue. Oh, Kaylin sent me a heart. I'll pretend it's because she loves me so much and not because we're talking about cardiac muscle, right? <laughs> we, we had Valentine's Day, so it's a belated Valentine. We'll, we'll say that. Speaking of hearts, 
when we talk about the type of muscle tissue that I find making up the heart, which kind of muscle tissue is that? Not a trick question. Yeah, exactly. The type we just talked about. So the type of muscle tissue that makes up the walls of the heart, that's cardiac muscle tissue. Fun fact, cardiac muscle tissue only found in the heart. That's the only place we find it. When we start talking about some of these other types of muscle tissue, we find them in multiple places, but cardiac muscle tissue is only found in one. Let's talk about the kind in my favorite system in the intestines. Which kind of muscle tissue lives in the intestines? Yep, exactly. Smooth muscle found in the intestines. Smooth muscle is also found somewhere else. Where else do we have listed that we find smooth muscle? What's the other location on my list over here? Yeah, inside those blood vessels. Blood vessels, like we talked about with, uh, with thermal regulation, controlling your body temperature. That's done by smooth muscle. There, is, there are a couple other locations that we, we had on the, the location and function guide too. Do we remember what those, those other locations were? They kind of are in the same system together, the, the two that I'm thinking of. Yeah, so the stomach, is, we would say with the digestive system, with the intestines, absolutely, we'll, we'll, we'll add stomach to that. Yeah, so I was specifically thinking of the urinary system as well. Uh, so another location of smooth muscle would be the bladder and little tubes that connect to the bladder called the ureters. So smooth muscle found all over the place. Cardiac muscle only found in one place, and that one place is the wall of the heart. Last kind of muscle, skeletal muscle, we find that, this one should be the easiest to remember, right? We find that attached to the skeleton. So skeletal muscle is the kind of muscle tissue that attaches to the skeleton. Or on the tissue location and function guide, it says inside skeletal muscles. So the muscles that attach to the skeleton, they are made out of skeletal muscle tissue. Um, Kira asked a question in the chat about the part of the kidneys called the tubules. Uh, the tubules, to my knowledge, do not have muscle tissue in them. They just have simple cuboidal epithelium. I could be wrong. I haven't taught urinary system in a while, uh, but I'm pretty sure that the kidneys themselves just have the epithelial tissue, and specifically that simple cuboidal that's right lining those tubules. Yeah. All right, so we got our locations of our types of muscle tissue. Now we flip over to start talking about some of the features that we see on our different types of muscle tissues. So let's start with this one up here called intercalated discs. When we talk about intercalated discs, there's just one kind of muscle tissue that has these. Yeah, exactly, my chat is lighting up. That's cardiac muscle that has intercalated discs. And remember, that's kind of the way that you recognize them, one of the, the most recognizable features of them. So check this out right here, and these dark lines that we're seeing here, all of these dark lines between the cells, all of those are intercalated discs. The only kind of muscle tissue with intercalated discs is cardiac muscle tissue. When we talk about striations, there's actually more than one type of muscle tissue that has striations. We have two, to be more specific. Yeah, so the when we talk about striations, we can add a note for ourselves. The way you see striations is they look like stripes. So when we see light and dark, light and dark, that's what striations look like. So the one that it's most easily seen on is our skeletal muscle tissue here. You can really see those light and dark patterns. Some of my other cardiac muscle pictures show it a little bit better. Um, and if you, you squint, maybe you can kind of see a little bit of the pattern down here. But again, it's going to be that light and dark, light and dark pattern up and down. That's striations. So skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle both have striations. They both have stripes. 
only cardiac muscle has those intercalated discs, those dark lines. Our last statement here asks about the type of muscle tissue that does not have striations. Its name actually kind of tells me that it doesn't have striations. Yeah, so the type of muscle tissue that has no striations, that has no stripes, smooth muscle tissue. So smooth muscle tissue, no striations. There's no light and dark pattern. It looks more smooth in appearance. So everybody's striated, cardiac and skeletal, everybody except smooth muscle. So some of our, our big picture features of these types of tissues. One other important about our types of muscle tissue is whether or not you decide if these muscle tissues contract. When we talk about the kind of muscle tissue that you decide when it contracts, what's that one called? Which kind do we actually get to decide? Yeah, exactly. We actually get to decide skeletal muscle. That's actually the only kind you get to decide when it contracts. So that's why you can do a bicep curl or let's be real. That's why we can lay down in bed at the end of the day. Not nearly early enough, but at some point. I don't know uh, how closely you all follow the grade book in Blackboard, but some of my friends in class here today, uh, I graded your group wiki project shortly after midnight last night. So it was it was one of those days. <laughs> you saw an update in the grade book quite late. I, I was not, my skeletal muscles didn't take me to bed nearly early enough last night. But when they took me there, it was very voluntary. I was ready to go to bed. <laughs> so that leaves me the two kinds that I don't control. Remind me with my picture up here, which kind am I seeing up here that I don't control? What's this one up here a picture of? Yeah, so this is my smooth muscle. So this is the one we talked about in places like the digestive system, in places like the urinary system. We've, we've made this joke before, we'll make it again. You don't want to have to control smooth muscle. The kinds of places, like we talked about in class before, your digestive tract, if you had to decide to, to move food through your digestive tract, literally that would be your entire existence is eating something and then thinking about it moving through your body and then realizing maybe halfway through digesting it that you're hungry again and having to try to think about moving two different things through your intestines. So yeah, it would be a, a terrible kind of existence. So we're all very happy that we do not have to control smooth muscle. We are all also very happy that we don't have to control this one down here. What was this one again? What's that one? Yeah, cardiac muscle, right? So cardiac muscle found in one place in the body. Where do we find this? Yeah, exactly. This is the kind of muscle tissue that makes up the walls of the heart. This kind of muscle tissue is literally always contracting. So this kind of muscle tissue, when you're sleeping, keeps chugging along. And when you're awake, keeps chugging along. If we had to control both of these, pretty sure we wouldn't live very long, right? <laughs> you're trying to make some decisions here. Am I pumping my blood or am I getting nutrients from my food? Well, I need nutrients to power my heart, but I need oxygen to be able to use nutrients it, the decisions are, are mind blowing. So we're very grateful that we do not control smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. We do control skeletal muscle. That's what allows us to move. That's what allows us to do things. Before we move on from muscle histology or this general review of the functions, are there any questions or thumbs up? Questions or thumbs up? Or we can flex our biceps. <laughs> All right, well, we're, we're looking good. So we'll go ahead then and move from muscle histology into our muscle models. 
we have three different models here. They're each showing me one type of muscle tissue. So let's go through and we identify each of these types of muscle tissue and we'll remind ourselves of some of the most important structures that we see inside of them. So uh, let's start with my type of muscle tissue that I see down here. We're gonna call this number one. Tissue number one, uh, which kind of muscle tissue can we tell? Which kind of muscle tissue are we looking at here for number one? Yeah, exactly. So tissue type number one in this model, bottom corner, this is cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle. Let's talk about some of the ways that we know that this is cardiac muscle. The first way that we know that this is cardiac muscle, notice how these cells are shaped kind of like the letter V. See how we kind of got a V shape going on here? This is what we call branched cells. Yeah, like Kira put in the chat, this is what we call branched cells. So the fact that it's, it's not just a straight line, that's called a branched cell. And this is going to allow our cardiac muscle cells to connect with each other better. It's gonna make it easier for you to, con to contract your entire heart all together at the same time. So. First thing we see on this model, these branched cells. Second thing we see on this model, which is something that we saw on the slide as well, are these things right here. So these are an up close and personal look at what an intercalated disc actually looks like, an intercalated disc. Remember that intercalated discs were those dark lines on, on the tissue? What they actually are is the place where one plasma membrane from one muscle cell connects to the plasma membrane of another cardiac muscle cell. So you can see their two membranes coming together at this place called an intercalated disc. The other thing I'll mention that you can see on this type of tissue, I'm not gonna tag it or ask you to identify it on the model, but the other thing you can kind of see is notice how right here there's this green line and then there's a pink line and then there's a green line and a pink line and we're alternating green and pink, green and pink, going all the way through this cell. Remember that cardiac muscle was a type of muscle tissue that is striated, that it has stripes. So technically, if, if we wanted to try to label the striations, if you will, we can see a dark band right here and then a light band next to it and then a dark band here and a light band next to it. So we're seeing stripes or we're seeing striations. That's the other thing that, that we said we saw in cardiac muscle tissue, that it was striated muscle tissue. You can see the striations a lot better in this kind of muscle tissue. See how we can really see dark and light, dark and light, dark, so on and so forth. Yeah, so, so Kira's right. What we're, we're seeing up here, this model is showing a skeletal muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue. So skeletal muscle tissue, one of, of the first things that, like we already mentioned, that we can see is we can see those striations. Again, I'm, I'm probably not gonna label them on an assignment and ask you to tell me what they are, but they are those stripes that we see, are striations. Those striations, those stripes, are found inside these big, long protein tubes. Now, when we look at skeletal muscle tissue, and we will do this at the very beginning of unit three in lecture, so next topic for us, muscle tissue in lecture. This is one big cell. And inside that cell, we have these long protein tubes that you can see here. These protein tubes get wrapped up in, in what looks kind of like cheesecloth. So let's talk about these protein tubes. We'll do the protein tubes first. So here's one, oops, let's get my pencil back. Here's one, here's another one, each of these tubes. These are things called myofibrils, myofibrils. So myofibrils are the little protein tubes 
that are found inside a single muscle cell. Myofibrils, the things that have these striations, that have these stripes. Each skeletal muscle cell is made of a bunch of these myofibrils. So you can see there are lots of them gathered together here in a group. This is, in uh, the words of, of your packet, this is the contractile proteins that are gonna help us actually do the process of muscle contraction, these big, long protein tubes. To make muscle contraction happen, we need to use a couple of different structures. One of those structures is this blue honeycomb looking thing that we see right here. And you can see it actually in lines going up. So again, a lot like a, a honeycomb, this blue pattern here. This is something that we call the T tubules. So T tubules are the way that your muscle cell is gonna send a message to contract all the way up and down that cell. Because see right here, I'm seeing a neuron. That neuron is sending a message to this muscle cell to contract, and that message is received right here. So maybe if we're lucky, this myofibril that's right next to the neuron would contract from that message that's right there. But it's not just this myofibril that needs to contract. We also need this one all the way over here and this one in the back and this one here in the front. We need all of the myofibrils made out of the proteins that contract. We need all of them to contract at the same time. That's what T tubules are gonna help us to do. They send a message all throughout the muscle cell to get that muscle to contract. Another important structure for muscle contraction though is this that we see right here. Again, this little cheesecloth or spider web looking thing that we can see right here. This is what we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Hey, I promise this is not a trick question. Sarcoplasmic reticulum sounds a lot like another organelle, like a regular organelle in, in a regular cell. What does sarcoplasmic reticulum kind of sound like? What does that sound similar to? Yeah, exactly. Kira, Kira took one for the team for us and, and typed it out because it's a long name, right? This sounds a lot like the endoplasmic reticulum, the endoplasmic reticulum. That's because it actually is the endoplasmic reticulum, in particular, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So this blue honeycomb that we're seeing here that's the, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or just what, what we actually call it is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, inside my muscle cell. Oh, I apologize. I, 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 I misspoke. Yeah, that's, that's correct. <laughs> Kira caught me and, and Audrey caught me too. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is the white part. The T tubules are, are the blue part. So the smooth ER of a muscle cell, this white part, the, the spider webs, when we're talking about what it does in a muscle cell, this is what stores and releases calcium. Calcium is gonna be really important in the process of muscle contraction. That's what's gonna tell a muscle whether we should or should not contract, whether or not there's calcium released. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores that calcium. When the T tubule that lives right next door to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, when this T tubule says, hey, we got the message to contract, it causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to spit out calcium. And when it spits out calcium, that's going to allow your muscle cell to contract. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the spider webs, or the cheesecloth, if you know what that is, the blue stuff, those T tubules that send the messages, and these big, long protein tubes, these are myofibrils. Is that all the structures we had to label on, on skeletal muscle? I don't have my list of structures in front of me. Yeah, so Kira's mentioning a, a study tip that you can, can almost see the, the, 
the color blue in the tubule's name. That's a good way to remember it. Yeah. And Fanchon's mentioning, just like in yesterday's class, we talked about the functions of calcium. Here's a big, a big another extra function for calcium. It makes your bones strong and it helps your muscles to contract. So we need, need that calcium. All right, by process of elimination, my last kind of muscle that I see on my model here, this is what smooth muscle looks like. Smooth muscle. With smooth muscle, there's really not a lot that you need to know. Um, one of the big things to know about smooth muscle, this is the shape of a smooth muscle cell. So we call it a spindle shaped cell spindle shaped uh, because this is what a spindle looks like. If we had a bunch of thread around it, this is what a spindle looks like. Uh, other than that, inside the cell, you can see their really large nucleus, which is what we saw on the slides when we looked at this type of muscle tissue. So we've got a nucleus and we've got a spindle shaped cell. We don't have dark and light bands like we see here. We don't have striations. We don't have those striations where the colors are different. Again, that's why it's smooth muscle. So smooth muscle has the spindle shaped cells. It has that large central nucleus. That's what we see in smooth muscle. We're gonna spend most of our, our class time today focusing on skeletal muscle tissue. In particular, now we're actually gonna zoom in, looking at a model that's kind of zooming in even closer on this part in one myofibril of a skeletal muscle cell. So let's zoom in close to something that's called the sarcomere. Let me write that word up top, the sarcomere. Okay, by the way, we will talk about this in, in lecture more too, but anytime you see the beginning part sarco, you should be thinking muscle, sarco, means muscle. Just like what was that beginning part for cartilage? What did I use at the beginning of cartilage? Yeah, exactly. So here we'll make a list for ourselves. Chondro meant cartilage. Uh, we also had osteo. What did osteo mean? Now osteo was our one for bone. So we're gonna to add to our list here, sarco. Sarco means muscle. So we just talked about before the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's the endoplasmic reticulum of, of a muscle cell. Um, we also have this contractile unit we're talking about, the thing that actually changes size, called the sarcomere. Sarcomere. Uh, the, the other prefix I'll mention for us, because you'll see this a lot in this lesson too, is myo. Myo is the other thing that means muscle. Um, so we, you'll be reading about when you're working through the guided lesson, uh, things like the epimesium epimesium that has has the myo or, or the mesium in it that's connective tissue around a muscle so connective tissue around muscle i'm trying to think of of some other good examples i mean we just talked about the myofibrils that are inside uh, the big long protein tubes inside of muscle fibers. Yeah, Kira mentioned one of the really important proteins in muscle contraction is called myosin. Yeah, myosin. So this lesson is going to have a lot of things that have sarco or myo in their name because we're talking about muscle tissue. So this whole thing that we're looking at here is what we call a sarcomere. The sarcomere is what actually changes its size to take a long muscle cell from being long to being much shorter when you're doing the process of muscle contraction. A sarcomere 
is framed in on either side by these little zigzag zigzags. These guys are called the Z disks. Z disks. So there's two of them, one on each side. This is what marks the beginning and the end of a sarcomere, this zigzagging Z disk. In the middle of the sarcomere, we have something called the, anybody know? In the middle, yeah, in the middle, we have the M line, the M line. So the M line is the midline of our, uh, our sarcomere. When a muscle contracts, the two Z discs will move toward the midline, toward the M line in the middle of the sarcomere. In the middle of the sarcomere, there is a space that just has these really thick blue proteins. So see how I've got my M line, but then next I have some spaces that just have this thick protein in it. Let's start first with naming that protein. We'll name it again on, on another slide. Yeah, so, well, my friend here, we'll, we'll write it because a couple of my friends gave it to me here. Um, that region we're talking about is the H zone. The H zone is a place where we only have myosin. So myosin on this model is the really thick blue protein that I can see right here. You'll recognize it because it has these little things that kind of look like golf clubs. So myosin with its little heads that I can see here. Next to it, or on top of it kind of, the red protein. We'll label this again on the other slide. It's called actin. It's the big red protein. Those are the two main contractile proteins, meaning these are the proteins that actually slide past each other when a muscle is contracting. So inside my sarcomere, from one Z-disc to another Z-disc, in the very middle, I have this place called the M-line. And next to the M-line, I only have myosin. This space where there's only myosin in the middle of a sarcomere that's called the H zone, the H zone. This model, if, if we were in lab together, this is actually one of the coolest models that we have because it actually moves, so it slides. So imagine with me, I can't show you in real life, but imagine with me that we took this Z disc and we pulled it this direction. So imagine that we pulled this way. As I, I show you this next picture, let, well, I guess technically we're showing this side, right? Imagine that I took my Z disks and I pulled them the opposite direction. That's what my next picture is gonna show me. The exact same thing, but when I expanded it out. Here's what it looks like when we expand out that Z disk, when we pull it away from our M line. So some of the structures we already talked about, we talked about that M line that's in the middle of the sarcomere, and we talked about the Z disc that's on the edge. Remind me again, what did we say that the name of the blue protein was? This big blue protein right here? Who's this? Yeah, this is myosin. The big blue protein is myosin. Myosin's little golf club heads like to attach to our red protein. The red protein is called actin. When a muscle is contracting, myosin pulls on actin and actin slides past it. But your muscles are not always contracting. That's why I've got some regulatory proteins. One of them the yellow spaghetti noodle looking one that kind of wraps around actin all over the place. This is what we call tropomyosin. Tropomyosin. The way you can remember what tropomyosin does is based on its name. Tropomyosin covers the myosin binding sites or the place where myosin likes to attach to actin, tropomyosin lays on top of that. 
and if tropomyosin is laying on top of the myosin binding sites, myosin can't attach. So muscle contraction can't happen if tropomyosin is in place. But tropomyosin, this yellow line that we see here, it, it is kind of helpful to maybe think of it kind of like a wet spaghetti noodle where you can't really wrap that around something without helping it out. So we see these little green proteins that you can see here. I like to call these green proteins the pushpin proteins. Uh, so yeah, the technical name for these green proteins, they're called troponin. I like to think about troponin like a pushpin. So it pushes on tropomyosin and keeps tropomyosin in place. So as long as troponin is pushing on tropomyosin, myosin cannot attach to actin. When muscle contraction happens, that calcium that we talked about, that the sarcoplasmic reticulum spits out, that calcium attaches to troponin, the pushpin pops out, and then tropomyosin falls off as well. Once this falls off, myosin and actin can get friendly and they'll scoot past each other. This is what a relaxed sarcomere looks like. I know that because look at all of the space here on myosin that's not overlapping with actin. There's a whole lot of space where actin's by itself and a whole lot of space where myosin is by itself. Do we remember what did we call this space here where myosin is by itself? What do we call that one? Yeah, exactly. We called that the H zone, the H zone. So the place where we just have myosin, that's called the H zone. We also have a special name for the places where we just have actin. The places where we just have actin, yeah, they're called the I band the I band. Hey, so check this out. Here's how I like to remember this. I, when I, I picture that letter I, that's a thin letter or really skinny letter. H is a thick letter, right? It's really wide letter. The I band only has what we call the thin filament. The thin filament is actin. It's not nearly as wide as myosin. So the letter I, that's a really skinny or really thin letter. That's where I find the thin filament, actin. The letter H, a very thick or wide letter, that's where I'm gonna find the thick filament. And the thick filament is, is made out of myosin. Something we're not making you learn this semester, but as, as a heads up for you, we also have an area called the A-band. And that includes something called the zone of overlap, the zone of overlap, where actin and myosin, see how they're overlapping with each other? The A band includes that area where they're overlapping with one another. I like to remember that because if you take an H and you try to fold it into an I, so if we, we take our letter H, right, here's my H, and I kind of bend it toward the middle, toward where the letter I would be, you get the letter A. So the A band where I overlap the thick filament with the thin filament. I think we labeled all of our structures on the sarcomere. Is that correct? Did we hit everything? Perfect. I feel like I have talked way too much. I need all to send me some emojis. What are we thinking? How are we feeling? I am gonna send you a penguin. What are you gonna send me back? Oh, Carissa's sending me a heart. That's so sweet. Thank you, Carissa. <laughs> Very nice, Audrey. Audrey sent me the, the live long and prosper. I think I told you all right that uh, we are watching Big Bang Theory right now. So uh, that that emoji is particularly relatable right now from Big Bang Theory. Uh, Summer, I see your question 
uh, what in particular are, are you asking about the tissue layers? What do you mean by that? Like the, the mesium words or? Um, yes, it's summer here. Um, the endo and epimesium. I'm just confused like what goes, cause like on your number three question in the lab, you have like the connective tissue that surrounds each muscle cell and then another question so I'm just confused which one goes where. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can definitely talk about that. Let me see. Okay. Um, so let me pull up a blank whiteboard and we will talk about those things. Um, okay. So. Pulling out my lab manual here. Bear with me. Okay, so let's list some of those structures and we'll relate them to each other. Um, so we'll kind of start from uh, small and, and work our way up. So when, when we're talking about uh, muscle cells, I have a special name for muscle cells. And that special name for muscle cells, I call them muscle fibers, muscle fibers. So we will see that terminology a lot in lecture lesson number nine, talking about muscle fibers. Muscle fibers, just like regular cells, they have a plasma membrane. Does anyone happen to know, what do I call the plasma membrane on a muscle fiber or on a muscle cell? Have we matched that up yet? Yeah, exactly. A couple of us have. So the name of the plasma membrane on a muscle fiber is the sarcolemma. There's that sarco part again, the sarcolemma. When we talk about the way that muscle fibers work, not only do we have a plasma membrane, but we also have some connective tissue, both that wraps around cells by themselves and wraps around groups of cells. So when we look right on the outside of a muscle fiber sarcolemma, we see something called the endomesium. Ooh, I spelled that wrong. Try again. Endomesium. This is the connective tissue, tissue touching the membrane. So the connective tissue that touches the plasma membrane of a muscle cell, that's called the endomesium. It's all the way on the inside of a muscle wrapping around individual cells. So wrapping around the individual plasma membrane, the endomesium. When we think about doing muscle contractions, um, muscles never work by themselves. They're always gonna work together to make something happen. So when we talk about a group, of muscle cells that work together, we're talking about something called a fascicle, a fascicle, where there's a group of muscle cells that work together. This, when you, when you look at a model, uh, like our, our skeletal muscle man model, those lines that you're seeing in the muscles, those are probably fascicles, so groups of cells working together. When we pull all of these fascicles, all of these groups together, we're going to use something called the epimesium to wrap the entire muscle. So holding fascicles together, holding groups of cells together, is this wrapping that I find on the very outside of a skeletal muscle tissue called the epimesium. And that's going to wrap around your whole muscle, hold the whole muscle together help it to, to do its job. At the very edges of the muscle, we also have tendons. And tendons are places where we took that epimesium connective tissue and we connect muscles to bones. So at the end of, let's draw a little simple muscle here. At the end of the muscle, here's all of my muscle proteins, my muscle cells up here. At the end of it, where it anchors 
to, to the bone, that's going to be the tendon. Wrapping around this entire muscle on the outside, that's where we're going to find the epimesium. If we went in and we looked at, here, let's actually draw some fascicles. So here's one fascicle, here's another fascicle, here's another one. If I looked at the wrapping around individual, well, actually, we don't have to know the wrapping around individual fascicles, um, that's one in the middle called the paramecium. But if we zoomed in really close on these individual cells, that's where we see that endomesium. Any other of those words that we wanted to chat about? Or does that hit the tricky ones? Uh, there's one that says the parts of the sacrolemma that fold into the muscle fibers and allow membrane potential. What would that be? Let me toss that one out to the class. Okay. Does anyone know what we call the parts where I folded that sarcolemma in? Yeah, exactly. A couple of us have mentioned uh, the, the name of the places where you fold in the sarcolemma, where you fold in the plasma membrane are called the T-tubules, those honeycombs that we saw. It mentions the terminology, the, the muscle potential, or the action potential. Uh, again, we'll talk about this more in next unit in lecture, but potential is a fancy word for a message, basically. So we fold in the plasma membrane at these T-tubules to help us send that message all throughout the cell. Perfect. Okay, so we're feeling good, better about it now. And I'll mention too, I know the guided lesson has, has some other helpful things too. Uh, so take a peek for, for any of those ones that, that we didn't cover. Please check that out too, because I bet that would be a good, a good help. All right, so we covered the sarcomere, which means we're done looking at the small scale anatomy of muscles. We are now going to take a step back and we're going to look at big picture muscles. And what I mean by that is we're going to look at the, the many hints that you can get about a muscle based on its name. So we're going to talk about all the ways that, that we can name muscles. The reason we're taking some time to do this is because we're going to be learning a ton of different muscles this semester. We're going to have to know where they are. We're going to have to know what they do. If we can get some hints from their names, that will help our studying go faster. So let's talk about the rules that we use to name them so that our study time can go faster. First way that we can name muscles, um, and here I'll try to go in, in order that you have it on your sheet. Uh, one of the first ways we can name muscles is based on, on their location. So when we see a term like this, gluteus, gluteus refers to the gluteal region. Here's why, by the way, uh, we took the time in week two to learn our regional terms, because they're going to come back to haunt us. Uh, so we're asking if there's a particular page that this is in your packet. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of be talking through uh, it in part, it says part two, naming skeletal muscles. I'm not going to match exactly the examples that are in uh, your lab packet. Yeah, you probably won't have these pictures. This is just me talking through slightly differently uh, the same kind of content that you have there. So part two of, of your lab packet. Maybe just pull out a, a blank piece of paper and take some notes rather than, than trying to find it in the, the lab packet itself. All right, so let's talk about these guys. Gluteus medius, gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus. All of these muscles have the word gluteus in their name. That gives us an idea of their location or their general region. So if you're looking at a muscle and you see part of its name that reminds you either of a bone name, or in this case, remind you of um, a, a regional term that you learned, that gives you an idea of where you would find it in the body. So gluteus medius, gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus, all of these gluteus muscles, 
found in the gluteal region. But the second part of their name gives us another idea about these muscles. The second part of their name, so in particular maximus and minimus, these give us an idea of the relative size of these muscles. So gluteus maximus is the largest muscle that we find in the gluteal region. Next, we have this one called gluteus medius, which is kind of middle-sized. And then the smallest one, gluteus minimus, on the very inside. The names of these muscles give us two kinds of information. Their first name, gluteus, tells us their general location. Their second name, maximus or minimus, those kind of things, that's going to tell us their relative size. So look for size words in their names. Look for regional terms in their names. When we talk about the abdominal region, again, you're going to see a lot of muscles that have a regional term in their name. So many of them are going to have abdominus in them. Again, that tells us the abdominal region. But when we're in the abdominal region, the names are also going to have some other kinds of words in them. These words that we're seeing here tell us information about the direction that the muscle fibers in them go. So when we're looking at muscles like rectus abdominis and transversus abdominis and the oblique muscles, what those words in their name mean is the direction that the, the fibers are going. So this word rectus, rectus means parallel. The rectus abdominis muscle is the six pack muscle. It goes parallel to your vertebral column. So rectus abdominis is the parallel set of muscle fibers found in the abdominal region, rectus abdominis. Hey, transversus abdominis, this sounds a lot like a transverse plane. If you remember that transverse planes were the ones that, yeah, they kind of ran horizontally and they split us into a top piece and a bottom piece. Transversus abdominis has muscle fibers that are going the same direction that a transverse plane would go. So transversus, we're going, technically it means perpendicular to the midline, transversus. Rectus, we're going parallel. And then we've got a couple of muscles that are called oblique muscles. And these oblique muscles, just like an oblique plane, go at an angle. We actually have two sets of oblique muscles, abdominal region. We have what's called the external obliques on the outside. Notice how they kind of angle down toward the middle of, of the abdominal region. Underneath that, we have what's called the internal obliques, and they actually angle the other direction, kind of up toward the midline. So the words oblique, transversus, and rectus, all of these tell us the direction that the muscle fibers go. The word abdominus in their name gives us an idea of their general location. They're in the abdominal region. Let's talk about some muscles that are named by their shape and by their region. Again, we have things like or a muscle called orbicularis oris. Oris is just like the oral region. Where was that oral region? Do we remember that? The oral region? Yeah, exactly. So the oral region was the mouth. Oral health, right? That's what your dentist helps you with, your oral health. So orbicularis oris is a muscle we find by the mouth. Orbicularis oculi where do we think oculi might be? Yeah, several of us chiming in. Oculi is referring to the eyes, like those ocular lenses that you look through. Orbicularis oculi by the eyes. Orbicularis 
orus by the mouth. We didn't mention what this orbicularis word means. This is an, as a shape word. So sometimes muscles give us, the, their name gives us their shape. The orbicularis muscle is a circle shaped muscle. So think about an orb, like something that floats and glows. Uh, orbicularis is a, is a circle orb muscle, either that we find around the eye, orbicularis oculi, or that we find around the mouth, orbicularis oris. So you can see them here when we're looking at, at the muscle man, orbicularis oris. This is what allows you to pucker your lips or stick out your lips or whistle. Uh, versus orbicularis oculi, this is what's going to allow you to close your eyes. So orbicularis, circle shape, oculi, um, or oris telling us where we find it. Yeah, so there was a question in the chat about the mental region. The, the mental region in particular is, is just the chin. That's correct. So we've got a, a chin region, the mental region, and then we've got the orbicularis oris muscle that's found in the oral region. I believe it's not labeled, but I, I could be could be incorrect about this, but I think I'm not. Uh, this one right here, I believe, is actually called the mentalis muscle. It's yeah, it's it's a chin muscle because we're in the mental region. So I I have in in my family um, we have pretty pronounced chins and I can legit like wiggle my chin. So uh, my mentalis muscle is, is pretty legit, I think. So the mentalis muscle in the mental region, orbicularis oris in the oral region around the mouth. Good clarifying question. <laughs> yeah, Audrey says, now everyone's trying to move their chin. Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. I'm not so great at moving the ears, but I got the chin down pat. And I can, I can move that chin, although I have to like sit and think about it like everyone else is doing now. <laughs> We're all trying to wiggle our chins. <laughs> all right, let's talk some more uh, about other examples of muscles. Sometimes a muscle's name will give us an idea of what it does. So we're going to talk about muscle movement words here in just a bit. Uh, one of the words we'll talk about is flexion. So in the name of these muscles, we've got flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris. They both have flexor in their name. That's going to tell us that these are muscles that help with the process of flexion, which is basically bringing two things closer together. So flexor muscles, they do flexion. In a bit, we'll talk about extensor muscles. They do extension. So if you see a word in their name that looks like one of the action words we're going to learn here in a bit, that's what that muscle does. When we look at the long names of, of these muscles like flexor carpi radialis or flexor carpi ulnaris, we're getting a really good idea of exactly what they do. So we do flexion of the carpals is what this carpi part means. So this is one of my attachment sites, the carpal bones. This is my other attachment site or my, my region, the radi radialis, meaning we're on the radius side. So notice that flexor carpi radialis right here next to the radius on the thumb side, that's where it's attaching on the thumb side, versus flexor carpi ulnaris that I see attaching more on the ulna side of the carpals. So it tells us what we do and where we find it. We find it attached to the carpals and we find it by the radius or we find it by the ulna. Again, look for the names of bones. Look for those regional terms. Any kind of hint that you can find in the name of a muscle will be helpful for you as you're learning where these muscles are found or in the case of a flexor, as you're learning what it does. When we go down into the legs, we can see some more examples of, um, of words that help us to interpret things. So in the legs, we have a muscle group called the quadriceps. 
So when someone is working out and they say, oh man, my quads, this is working out my quads. That's actually a group of four muscles. That's what quadriceps means. We've got four muscles or four attachment sites, more technically. In that quads muscle group, we have something called rectus femoris. Remember, we already saw this rectus word. That gives us an idea of the direction that those, those muscle fibers go in. So rectus femoris parallel to the femur, because there's femoris. We also have some muscles that are called vastus muscles. The word vastus tells me their size. The vastus muscles are very large. So we have vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and the hidden one we can't really see, vastus intermedius. When we're talking about these vastus muscles, now we're using directional terms, right? Medialis and lateralis. So literally what the name of these muscles means, literally this means the big one on the middle. This one literally means the big one on the outside. So if you see those directional terms, that's a good hint for us too. Uh, I can't remember if I put it in my example or not, but you have, in, when you're working on naming things, you have the example of, of muscles called supraspinatus and infraspinatus, referring to superior and inferior. We'll see superior and inferior. We will see medialis and lateralis. We will see several of those directional terms that we learned way back in week one, back to haunt us. So keep that in mind when we're, when we're looking at our, our muscle names. It might give us an idea of which direction they are compared to each other. There are a couple others, I, I didn't include pictures in my notes, a couple others that, that you have when you're filling out your, your part two of the packet. Um, one of them is talking about muscles that are named based on their shape. So a good example of this that we didn't talk about, we did talk about the orbicularis muscles that are a circle, uh, but another really good one for you to consider is the deltoid muscle. Deltoid, as in it looks like a delta, which is a triangle. Um, so there, there's that shape. Uh, we talked about size words. We talked a little bit about how quadriceps is the number of attachment sites. There's four attachment sites. Uh, other than that, I think we talked through most of, of those rules. So the, the big idea with the rules look for as many hints as possible to try to figure out what was what kind of information their name tells us by the way you'll get a bunch of practice on the homework assignments using the name of muscles to predict things about them here is dr aulis's wink wink nudge nudge let me back up a slide here when you're looking at your homework question and it says the muscle rectus femoris has information about it in its name. What does the word rectus tell us about this muscle? Please make sure that if that's your question, if it asks you what the word rectus tells you about the muscle, please make sure that you tell me that rectus means that it's parallel or it tells us the direction that those muscle fibers are going. Please don't tell me the kind of information that the word femoris in its name tells me if I was asking you about rectus. So pretty much all the muscles in the body, their name is gonna give us more than one kind of information. Pay very close attention to the, the specific word in its name that I'm asking about. Because if I ask you about the word rectus, you'd give me one answer, the direction of the muscle fibers. If I ask you about the word femoris, you'd give me a different answer, which is the general location that we find it. So please pay attention to those questions. 
which of the words in its name am I asking about vastus or am I asking you about medialis? Either you tell me its size or you tell me its location compared to another muscle. So you're gonna have lots of those practice questions on your homework assignments starting this week and going forward. Read them carefully. Please don't lose points because you read it too fast. Thumbs up. We track in with, with Dr. Aulis with that note for you. Got at least one thumbs up. Perfect. Lots of thumbs up and a frog. I, I feel ya. I, I, I'm frogging it up too, right? Going a little frog-eyed. <laughs> we say bug-eyed, going frog-eyed, right? <laughs> All right. Let's talk about muscle movements. When we are learning the movements that muscles do in the body, there are many pairs of, of words that can tell us the actions that we can do. Good news, you are not sitting in class with me right now, so no one else is gonna see you if you act out these muscle movements. Also good news, when you take the exam, nobody is around you to watch you figure out what, a mu what movement a muscle is doing. So this is really good news for you. Like the one benefit of, of online learning is that no one's gonna see you looking silly when you're sitting at your desk doing abduction. No one's gonna see, but you're gonna remember what abduction looks like. So I'm gonna try to explain to you and maybe try to do a little bit of a stick figure action here to tell us what these movements are. Yeah, please, um, please act these things out. Um, yeah, so Caitlin's mentioning that Proctorio will see you. I don't think that Proctorio is going to flag you. TN was, was wondering if it would flag you. I don't think it'll flag you. Um, and if it does, I, I look very briefly at the report. And if it tells me that you were moving too much, I'll know that you're just doing an interpretive dance and we'll call it good. I won't watch you. <laughs> so feel free to move. I promise I'm not going to stare you down and be like, oh my gosh, that's the most inspiring dance ever. <laughs> All right, let's talk about these words. Let, and these are words, by the way, remember I, I tell you that a lot of times flashcards aren't super helpful for our class, but these are our flashcard helpful things. So flexion, we're all very familiar with flexion. Flexion is when you do a bicep curl and you take that weight that's, that's when your arm is down at 90 degrees and you bring it close together. So here's my simple drawing of flexion. We've got an arm holding a weight and we take that weight and we bring it closer together. So this is flexion because the amount of space between my two parts of my arm, it got smaller. So in flexion, angle or space between bones is smaller. That's what happens in flexion. The opposite of flexion then is extension. Extension is when you take that weight from the upright position and you put it back down to 90 degrees. So extension is when we take our, our weight in our bicep curl and we take it back down. This is extension because the angle got much bigger. When the angle gets bigger, that is extension. Now I'm hoping that at home, you were already doing this biceps flexion, so bringing your hand up to your shoulder and then doing extension, putting your hand back down. What I want everyone to do now is I want us to do flexion and extension at our knee joint. So theoretically, you're sitting up right now. Your legs, your knees are at a 90 degree angle. So let's draw what theoretically we look like, okay? When we're like this, here's my foot, and we put our leg like this, that is extension of the knee. Notice that it's still extension because my angle went from this big to this big. My angle is much bigger. This movement is actually moving your leg toward the front side of your body. Whereas when we did this with our arms, remember you got your hand up by your shoulder and you extend it down, 
we're moving toward the back side of the body. Flexion and extension look opposite when we're talking about the elbow versus the knee. If we're just looking at directions that things move, but it's not about directions. It's about the angle or it's the amount of space between the bones. So flexion, we bring things closer together. Extension, they're farther apart. Abduction is my favorite one to act out in class. Um, so abduction is when I'm standing in class and I'm teaching you, but all of a sudden the aliens have, they've finally found me and they're going to take me away. Abduction is when my arms go up or when I move things uh, away from the midline of the body. So I go from having my arms down to my arms going up. You do the same thing with your legs. Your legs can be abducted. Um, when I tell the aliens, you can't have me, so they're, they're trying to abduct me. They're, they've got me by the arms, and I tell them there's no way. I have too much to live for. When I bring my arms back down, back toward the midline of my body, that's adduction. So you add them back or you abduct them away. You can also do this if you don't want to have an alien abduction in your bedroom right now. Here's something I want everyone to do. So I want you to hold your hand up in the air with your palm facing toward your computer. Spread your fingers out. So you've got all five fingers holding up. Got the number five. Now bring all of those fingers together so that you're, you're holding up a flat hand. What we just did was adduction. We moved everything toward the midline of the hand toward the middle finger. When you spread them back out, so make those that five again, when you spread them back out, that is abduction. So adduction and abduction, it's all about the midline, away from the midline, whether it's the midline of the body, which is what's happening with the arms going up, or the midline of your hand, when we're spreading out those fingers, abduction, we move stuff away from the midline. Adduction, we move stuff toward the midline, back toward the middle. I had seen a question in the chat um, with specifically in relation to, to flexion and extension, but I think it also applies to most of these terms, asking if we'd only use that for the arms and the legs. Uh, primarily, we're going to use that to describe various different joints at the arms and the legs. So that could be the wrist joint, the shoulder, the ankle, uh, but we can also use this actually to describe the torso. So when you do a crunch, you're doing flexion. And when you go back to the upright position, that would be extension. So really, it can be any part of the body when we're moving uh, closer together or farther apart, flexion and extension. It's just easiest to see with the arms and the legs. All right, next set of, of movement words are rotations. So rotations, uh, for us to think about these ones, we always have to think back to anatomical position. Remember that in anatomical position, your palms are facing forward. So when I talk about medial rotation, Think about at your shoulder joint, when you rotate your entire arm toward the middle of the body. So we kind of shrug your shoulder in, medial rotation, or lateral rotation, when we rotate the shoulders back out. You can also do this at the hip joint. So when you rotate your entire leg toward the middle, medial rotation, or rotate the entire leg toward the outside, lateral rotation. When I'm at the ankle joint, I can do some special things. One of the set of special things I can do is called inversion and eversion. I like to think of these as the two ways you can roll your ankle. So you can either invert your ankle where you twist it where the sole of your foot goes toward the middle, roll your ankle in, or you can evert your ankle where you roll it toward the outside. Now, as someone who growing up did a whole lot of spraining ankles, thinking about these two ways of spraining my ankles, 
brings back like bad memories. <laughs> I don't want to invert or evert my ankle. But these are, like I said, the two ways you can twist your ankle. Invert it in or evert it out. Watch where the sole of the foot goes, toward the middle or toward the outside. You can also do with the ankle joint what's called dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Let's start with plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is what you're doing when you stand on your tiptoes. So when you push your foot into the ground, you're planting your, your foot down and you're standing on, on your tiptoes to be taller or to peek over at something. That's called plantar flexion. Incidentally, that's also what, what heels make a woman's leg do, con constant plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is what you do when you're rocking back on your heels. So when you're, when you're resting on the heels and you, you pull your toes toward the back side of your body, remember that dorsal meant the back. Dorsiflexion, we're, we're flexing our foot toward the back side of the body. So dorsiflexion, the toes go toward the back side of the body. Plantar flexion, the toes go toward the ground, toward the plantar region. And then a couple of movement words that we use to describe the jaw. Uh, we can use them in, in other places too, but um, the way we're learning them is in particular related to the jaw. The first one is called retraction. Retraction is when you, you take your mandible, your jawbone, and you pull it backwards. You retract it. There is an opposite word to retraction. It is not elevation. These guys are not a pair. Everybody else has been a pair. These guys are not a pair. My opposite to retraction, yeah, Kira's right, is called protraction. So when your jaw is protruding, when you stick out that bottom jaw, that's protraction. When you pull it back in, that's retraction. Protraction and retraction, specifically things we talk about related to the jaw. Another thing we can talk about related to the jaw is elevation. When we're chewing or when we're lifting our jaw up to talk, that's elevation. The opposite of elevation is depression which is when your jaw drops and you see something, right? When you, you saw your score on the midterm exam or when you looked at the class schedule and realized that we're halfway through the semester. Although I guess that probably wouldn't be depressing, right? That would be exciting, maybe. Depression, when, when your jaw goes down, elevation, when your jaw goes up. We will also see these words uh, when we're talking about the scapula. Does anyone remember where the scapula is? Where's that bone? It's gonna be a while until we talk about that one again. Exactly, yep, that is our shoulder bone. The one that when you feel your shoulder blades, you are feeling part of the scapula. So besides the mandible, we also use these elevation and depression words to describe how the scapula moves as well. So study pro tip, again, I mentioned this before, but I'm going to say it again. It, it's not going to help you a ton to memorize the technical definition of these movement words. What's going to help you way more is to be able to act them out. And the reason that, that it's going to help you so much, too, is I'm going to show you, um, hopefully we'll have time to do it today, uh, at the end of the semester, on the final exam, we're gonna ask you to make some predictions about muscle movements. So we're gonna make up a bogus muscle, we're gonna show you where it is, and we're gonna ask you, what movement word would you use to describe this action? It's not gonna help you to have the, the movement description memorized when you're looking at something. What's going to help you is knowing what it feels like on your body. So start now by learning what these movements feel like. And as we go through the semester and as we keep talking about what muscles do what, please try to act out those actions as much as possible. That's really going to help you out.
Yes, I've got a, a, a joking question in the chat. Elevation is talking and depression is being quiet. Yeah, when your jaw drops and there's nothing to say, <laughs> that that would be quiet. Elevation when we, we've got all the words, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So practice acting these things out. We are, are not going to use a lot of these movement words when we talk about this week's muscles, but next week's muscles coming soon we're gonna use a lot of these different words. So please make sure we know them going into next week. I'll mention um, when, when we're talking about muscles, a couple of, of words for you to keep in mind, and you have these at, at the, the bottom of this page on your packet. We have things called the prime mover. What we're gonna be learning for the most part this semester are the prime movers or the muscles that are most responsible for a particular action. But muscles very rarely work by themselves. They usually have a synergist, that's a helper muscle, that can't do the action by itself, but if it's working together with the prime mover, it can do it. So synergists and prime movers, they work together to do a movement. But we also have uh, what are called antagonists. So an agonist or a prime mover is the muscle that does an action. When that muscle is doing the action, its antagonist is, is not doing anything, it's relaxing. The antagonist actually, when it contracts, does the opposite action of what we just talked about. So on your body, we're gonna see this as we go week to week, the muscles that live on one side of, of a joint or one side of a bone will do one motion like flexion, for example and the muscles that live on the other side of that bone will do the opposite action. These ones will do extension. That's what we mean when we talk about antagonists, somebody that does the opposite action of somebody else. So general rule of thumb, keep this in mind going forward. Muscles that live on one side of the body do the opposite of muscles that live on the other side of the body, whether that's the arm, whether that's the leg, whether that's the torso. If you live on the front, you typically are going to do the opposite thing of somebody who lives on the back. That's what antagonists are. That brings us into our first set of working on bones and muscles. Now, I I'm skeptical that I can get visible body to work. Um, I, I may try again another day. I don't want my computer to crash today. Um, but here is where I, I really want to encourage you. In the visible body folder for this week, there's a practice activity for you where you've got the muscle man and you've got the skeleton. There are a lot of different structures that we're learning this week whether it's our different types of ribs, um, whether it's that hyoid bone, we're talking about uh, the clavicle and then the, the hip bones, please make sure to take some time in visible body to work on finding bones and finding bone markings before you try to do the homework assignment. Because it's gonna cost you points and make you frustrated if you're trying to, to do things in visible body in the assignment first. So use that practice assignment to find these things first um, and, and then work through it. Um, Fanchin's mentioning she had some issues with the practice assignment. Let me see. I'm going to try to pull it up and we're going to uh, we're going to see if my computer gets real mad at me. <laughs> While that's trying to pull up, let me mention really fast. Uh, when we're looking at the abdominal muscles, remember that the abdominal muscles come in multiple different layers. So we've got deep layers, we've got superficial layers. Again, you can see deep versus superficial. Make sure that as you're labeling, you keep track of which layer it is that we're labeling. You will notice this on the homework assignment as well. It's going to tell you if you're looking at the deep or the superficial part. So pay attention to those, those levels that we're labeling those muscles at. When we're on the inside, by the way, 
notice that we're labeling them from superficial to deep because now we're looking in the very middle of the abdominal cavity. I'll help you out here. The one that's in the very middle is transversus abdominis. So notice how it's like a transverse plane going straight across here, transversus abdominis. And then on top of it are the two oblique layers that we see here. You can see another view of muscles uh, where I wanted. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get visible body. I'm going to try to share my screen with you. We're going to see if it gets really angry because it, it has in the past. We'll, we'll give it a try. Um, yeah. Best of luck. If it dies, I promise I'll come back. <laughs> um, hopefully it doesn't die. Okay, here goes nothing. Okay, it's not dead yet. If you stop hearing me, I will come back again. Uh, so we're looking here at visible body, we're in the skeleton. So it's not anything in particular yet for your practicing. Uh, let me hide this. Um, what we need to do is we're learning the bones of the hip, for example. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna click. Here's where we put it to the real test. Awesome, okay. So notice how I clicked on, on this bone right here. It's telling me that this is the particular one called the ilium. Remember that the hip bones are made out of three bones. The ilium, which is what you put your hands on, the ischium, which is what we sit on, and the pubis in the front by the pubic symphysis. On the ilium, this bone up here that I put my hands on my hips, there are some particular bone markings that you need to know. So I'm going to click on, see this little hip bone with all the, the pretty colors right here? I'm going to click on this, and it's going to take me just to the ilium. So this is just the ilium the the bone that we put our hands on notice how these little regions of this bone are all different colors these are all of the different bone markings that you could possibly label on the ilium we are not making you learn them all this is why i want you to play around with this before you go in to to take the the assignment so one of them that we're making you know is this one here on the top this one here on the top is called the iliac crest the iliac crest is what you put your hands on when you put your hands on your hips. So we need to know that the iliac crest is the bone marking up here at, at the top. Uh, let me see if they also have things labeled. Okay, they got a little specific on here and the word details is blocking it. Um, this divot right inside here is something called the acetabulum. Don't know how to get rid of that, sorry. So it's called the, there we go, called the acetabulum. The acetabulum is a bone marking that we actually see on all three of the, the bones of the hip. Uh, so here's the part of it that's from the ilium. The ischium would be attached right here. So it would also have a divot in it. That's the acetabulum. And the pubis forms the bottom portion down below. So the acetabulum, the big divot in the ilium, the iliac crest up here. Um, let me check my sheet. See what others we make you know. Okay, and then we make you know the greater sciatic notch. Let me see if I can get it to rotate. Could have been worse, okay. The greater sciatic notch, is, it's a notch. Remember that a notch was kind of an indentation? So the greater sciatic notch is gonna be the place when I'm looking at the bone uh, that I, I actually see uh, an indentation where the sciatic nerve would come out through. So the greater sciatic notch down here, we need to know that one. We need to know the iliac crest. And if we rotate back around, we need to know the acetabulum right down in here. 
So we can do this with each of the hip bones. Let me, let's see if this takes me back. There we go. Now I'm back. So I did that with, with the ilium. I can do the same thing with the ischium. I could do the same thing with the pubis here in the front. Remember, we are always clicking on this little landmarks right here or details right here to get to that, that fancy stuff. When we're talking about uh, the sternum, the sternum has several parts as well. I think I'm going to die in here. Let's try. Okay, there's my sternum bone. Let's see if I can get that one to pull up too. Okay, so it just pulled up for me the body of the sternum. Uh, that's the main part of the sternum. The other parts that we see up attached, it's, it's missing here, but up above it would be a thing called the manubrium, and down below it would be a little thing called uh, the xiphoid process. So a couple of different bone markings that when I'm looking at it in the entire skeleton, I should actually be able to just click on there. Let's see. There's my little xiphoid process. I know it, it's spelling is weird, but I'm fond of it. The little xiphoid process and then the manubrium up top. One of the questions in your lab packet asks you about the difference between a true rib and a false rib and a floating rib. So let's use visible body to show us this. When we look at the ribs, true ribs are ribs like we see up here, that connect directly to the sternum. I'm trying to get it, there we go, to click on it. So true ribs are ribs that connect directly to the sternum using their own cartilage. Like we can see here, their own cartilage. When we get down, and you can kind of see it right here, notice how we get down to this rib down here, and its cartilage doesn't reach all the way up to the sternum by itself its cartilage kind of goes halfway and it attaches to somebody else. That's when we get into what we call the false ribs. So the false ribs are the ribs that their cartilage attaches to the cartilage of another rib to get up to the sternum. So true ribs one through seven, their cartilage directly attaches to the sternum. False ribs are ribs eight, nine, and 10. Their cartilage attaches to other cartilage to get to the sternum. My last kind of ribs though, try to see them from the back here. My last kind of ribs are these two that I see in the very back. These two are what we call floating ribs. So floating ribs, number 11 and 12. Floating ribs don't even try. They have no cartilage. They're not trying to attach to the sternum at all. So floating ribs are my last two. They have no cartilage. Uh, true ribs, their cartilage attaches to the sternum. False ribs, we share a neighbor's cartilage to get there. Any questions about what you see have seen here in Visible Body before I briefly go back to that actions activity? Audrey asked about the due date on visible body. Uh, due date is Friday. So we need to get visible body done before spring break. All other lab homework assignments are due after spring break. Although with us having, uh, with us having that test on, on Monday and Tuesday when we get back from spring break, I'd say if you can, try to get that lab stuff wrapped up sooner rather than later. All right, let me pull up the action activity here to, to round off our time together. So the very last page in your lab packet, we're gonna see a lot of pages like this through the rest of the semester. My computer is gonna be way happier with visible body closed. <laughs> Okay, so you're gonna see this kind of activity every week, pretty much, for the rest of the semester. When we talk about muscles, they have things called origins 
and insertions. And we didn't talk a lot about this before, but this is something that you need to underline, highlight, star, make sure you know. When we talk about the origin of a muscle, this is the place where the muscle attaches that doesn't move when that muscle contracts. The insertion is the place that it attaches that does move when it contracts. So all of the muscles in your body have non-moving attachment sites called origins and moving attachment sites called insertions. When you do a muscle action, your insertion always goes toward the origin of the muscle. Let's go through and use um, the information about the origins and the insertions of a muscle to help us predict what its action is. So I'm actually gonna start here on step two. We're gonna draw our attachment sites of some muscles onto our skeleton. And then we're going to visualize or act out even on ourself what those movements would look like. So I'm gonna start with the origin. We're drawing rectus abdominis. By the way, before I draw this muscle, let's start with abdominis. What does this tell me about the muscle? What does abdominis tell me? Yeah, abdominis is its location, right? So this is something found in the abdominal region, absolutely. And this is a, is a rectus muscle. What did rectus mean? Do we remember what rectus means? Yeah, so it's parallel. In this case, we're parallel to the vertebrae. So rectus abdominis, if, if you remember, is the one we said was your six pack muscle. We're gonna be drawing the six pack muscle. So let's start by labeling the places that are the origin of rectus abdominis. So I'm gonna change to the color, uh, the color blue. Now, if you have not uh, already worked on bone markings yet, some of this stuff is, is gonna be a little weird for you because you don't know where these markings are. Uh, I would recommend doing this origin and insertion activity last once you feel good about bone markings. So one of the markings we're learning this week is called the pubic crest. Remember that a crest is some kind of projection. So on the pubic bone, we have a crest, which is kind of the top label. And then we also have the pubic symphysis. And the pubic symphysis is the location where there's fibrocartilage. So I just drew a little circle on it. The pubic symphysis, the cartilage at the front, of the two hip bones holding them together. The pubic crest is the ridge that's right next door to it. So see how I drew some blue here? This shows me the places where the rectus abdominis muscle attaches that are its origins. And remind me in, in the chat, when we talk about the origin of a muscle, it does or does not move the origin of a muscle. Yeah, so this is the part that's not moving. So your six pack muscle, the place that attaches that doesn't move is down here, the, the front part of your pelvis. Let's move to the insertions, the places where it attaches that do move. So I'm gonna switch colors here. First place that, that it attaches that does move is called the xiphoid process. That's this little green, I'm gonna color it green, the little bone at the bottom or the little part of the sternum at the bottom, the xiphoid process. It also attaches to what are called the costal cartilages. Costal means ribs and it's the cartilage that those ribs use to attach to the sternum. So costal cartilages, I'm gonna eyeball it of five through seven, okay? These are my insertions. Now we get to play connect the dots. So I'm gonna draw some lines here. I've just drawn, generally speaking, rectus abdominis, the six pack muscle. I've connected the origins to the insertions. Now I know you already told me this, but remind me again, is it the origin or the insertion that moves when a muscle contracts? The origin or the insertion? Yeah, exactly, it's the insertion, absolutely. And the insertion 
is going to move toward the origin. Again, here's where it's good news that you are by yourself watching our class. I want you to try to feel your xiphoid process, the bottom of your sternum. I want you to estimate where your pubic symphysis is because the xiphoid process is the insertion. I want you to move the insertion toward the origin. You should be doing or imagining doing a crunch. Yeah, we're basically doing a sit up. Exactly. We're moving the insertion, which is the xiphoid process in the ribs, toward the origin, toward the pelvis. So when we look at our options here for what movement this muscle does, our options are either that it flexes the pelvis superiorly, so it brings the pelvis up, or it flexes the rib cage anteriorly. It moves the rib cage down. What did we just say was the part that moved? Was it the pelvis or the rib cage that moves when I contract this muscle? Oh, we're 50-50 split. Here's where we get to refer back to our, our words here, right? The part that moves earlier, you told me, was the insertion, right? The insertion is what moves. So when I look at the insertion of this muscle, the moving part, what's actually doing the moving is the xiphoid process and that part where it's connected to the ribs. What's actually moving is the rib cage. So the rib cage moves because that's where the insertion is. The rib cage moves toward the pelvis. So when we're talking about our action of the rectus abdominis muscle, this is a muscle that flexes the rib cage. It's moving the ribs toward the hips because my insertion is on the rib cage and my origin is down on the pelvis. Yeah, I like it. Fanchon said green means go. I love it. You're always going to see on these activities, it's always going to tell you, use a green colored pencil to draw your insertion. That's a great way to think about it. Green means go. So we are, we're moving with this attachment site. I like that. Uh, so Tien is asking about a reverse crunch. So when you elevate the pelvis, um, that is probably a different set of muscles. Uh, I would suspect. Otherwise, um, I, I'm pretty, my, my short answer to your question about that, I think that's going to be a different set of muscles. Um, the other possibility, though, is that when we immobilize one part of the body, we can force another part of the body to move instead. So when we're making our predictions about what a movement is, Consider that every part could move. Obviously, if I if I make your um, your chest stable and you have no other option, uh, we could make the origin move toward the insertion. But in normal situations, the kind of predictions that we're making is that both of these are equally mobile. In normal situations, green means go. My origin or my insertion is going to move toward my origin. Yeah, so Anisha is mentioning we'd probably use our legs, for example, to, to move the pelvis, or we probably could use some of those back muscles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, using other muscles when other things get involved, when it's not just rectus abdominis, we can do all kinds of funky things with, with those movements. Yeah. All right, we are out of time for today. I want to mention that tomorrow I have student hours. So I'm available tomorrow from 1 to 2.30. Feel free to stop by with questions about lecture or lab. Friday is our first unit number two exam review session. If you know something right now that you want to make sure I cover on Friday, 
Can you put it into the chat for me before we, we wrap up for today? Um, I am planning to do a general review on Friday. I will uh, rely on you to give me some, some topics. I, I know that we probably want to go over that transcription and translation practice sheet. Uh, so we'll definitely plan to do that on Friday. But any other topics that, that you have in mind, either let me know today or via email or tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, plan to be back together on, on Friday. Yeah, Nisha is requesting five and six. Yeah, it's been a while since that, right? <laughs> yeah, Kaylin, that's okay. Your mind is, is blown from that still. Okay, so uh, we, we want to do five and six. Let me make a note for myself so I pull the right pictures. Five and six, we want to maybe talk about ossification. We want to remember what unit two is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, the tentative plan, unless I hear otherwise, I will primarily focus on five and six. Um, we will try to do some ossification stuff. If we have some time, maybe we'll try to touch on those bone disorders as well. Remember that by Friday, you need to complete your integumentary system assignment for lecture, and you also need to complete visible body for this week. So two sets of things due by Friday evening. Everything else due Sunday night before we come back from spring break. So lots of time on everything else. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the recording for today. But again, remember I'm available tomorrow with uh, student hours and I will also plan to see you all back on Friday for our exam review. So have a great afternoon.